Welcome, everyone. My name is Eric Owens, and I'm the chair of the Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion here at the AAR. And our committee sponsors the AAR's annual Martin Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Marty Forum. You may have heard in the past uh, six months or so as the news has come out that the American Academy of Religion's Board of Directors has recently adopted a new strategic plan that comes with a new uh, mission statement of sorts. And you can see the gigantic um, uh, banner behind me that says the AAR fostering excellence in the academic study of religion, sometimes shortened to the study of religion. And uh, very soon that, that uh, message will be changing to include excellence in the academic study of religion and enhancing the public understanding of religion. And that is a, uh, not merely a rhetorical change. It is a really important change in the understanding of what the AAR is about. Uh, the Marty Award was established uh, 22 years ago with a vision that what we did made sense outside of the academy as well as inside. And, that, and it, it, it does, it can, and it rightly should have impact in the public. And so this, uh, um, uh, this award recognizes uh, the importance of that work and the change in the strategic plan and the, and the language of what the AAR is about will reflect that too. So uh, look for that in your communications in the coming months. We gather today to honor Winifred Fowler Sullivan of Indiana University, who is the 22nd recipient of this prestigious annual award. Professor Sullivan is a member and former chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Indiana University Bloomington and an affiliated professor in Islamic Studies and at the Moorer School of Law. Named for the Distinguished Historian of American Religion, who was its first recipient in 1996, the Marty Award recognizes extraordinary contributions to the public understanding of religion by individuals whose work has a relevance and eloquence that speaks not just to scholars, but to other publics as well. Professor Sullivan is best known as a scholar of law and religion whose incisive analysis and provocative criticisms of religious freedom have produced an influential body of work, including The Impossibility of Religious Freedom in 2005 and her 2014 book, A Ministry of Presence, Chaplaincy, Spiritual Care, and the Law, which received the AAR Book Award for Excellence in the Analytical Descriptive Studies category. She has led her colleagues across fields in developing a comparative phenomenology of religion in contemporary legal contexts. Her most recent books and articles, written alone and in collaboration with other scholars, offer nuanced critical work on the politics of religious freedom that continues to inspire discussion and debate at, this, at these annual meetings and well outside of them as well. Beyond the Religious Studies Guild, Professor Sullivan's public scholarship and her work as an ex expert witness have had an important impact on courtrooms, prisons, military units, and government offices from city halls to the State Department. Her research and critical theory situates the relationship between these traditions of cultural authority, namely law and religion, within a broader comparative context. And she stands out as a scholar who produces and supports rigorous online conversations among scholars across disciplines at the Imminent Frame, a project of the Social Science Research Council. Professor Sullivan received her BA from Cornell University and went on to earn her JD from the University of Chicago Law School. She practiced law for six years in both the private and the public sector before returning to the University of Chicago to pursue a PhD in American religious history and the comparative study of religion. She has held, joint, she has held appointments at Washington and Lee University, the University of Chicago Divinity School, and the law school at the State University of New York before joining the faculty at Indiana University in 2012. For this important work and much more that we'll be hearing about today on this panel, the AAR's Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion is delighted to honor Winifred Fowler Sullivan with the 2017 Martin Marty Award. All right, settle down. <laughs> Rich, richly deserved. Um, I have refrained from offering a much more thorough introduction to Professor Sullivan's work because you'll soon be hearing much more about it. Uh, but I would refer you to Mara Willard's recent article about her career in Religious Studies News, which is published online through the AAR uh, with a more thorough, thorough analysis of her influence. 
Professor Sullivan's distinguished interlocutor for the Marty Forum is Lori Patton, an authority on South Asian history, culture, and religion who has taught at Bard College, then Emory University, and Duke University before becoming Dean of Duke's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, and in 2015 became the first female president of Middlebury College. I'm delighted to have you both here, and I look forward to your conversation. So welcome and congratulations. Can people hear me? No. Is this better? OK. Great. Welcome and congratulations, Winnie. It's fantastic. And as you can see from the um, enthusiastic response, um, you really have had an amazing influence on, on so many of us. Um, so I wanted to start off by mentioning that earlier you and I had a conversation about how we were going to roll this afternoon. And you mentioned that uh, you were surprised that you got the award. And I sensed, because most conversations I know you, uh, I've known you over the years, um, when you say you're surprised it isn't false modesty or anything like that, it's that there's a genuine intellectual engagement behind uh, the surprise. So tell me, tell me a little bit about why you were surprised you got the award. So um, I think maybe for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that, I, I frankly, I'm not sure I understand what the public engagement of religion is, I guess, or what it meant to the committee. Um, and perhaps it means to reference non-academic studies of religion. And in that case, it seems to me that I've had a pretty typical academic career, that I actually uh, write mainly for academic audiences and that I, my main audience is our students. Um, and I haven't written you know, in publications for general audiences or um, try to influence public policy directly. Um, but I do teach at a public university, and, uh, and this is something, this is the second public university I've taught at, and I've come to really respect and admire uh, the ethos of the public university in the United States. I was, uh, I was educated at private universities, but both at the State University of New York at Buffalo and in Indiana, there is um, a really strong commitment to public service uh, in the work of the public university, not just in the work of training our students and in our scholarship and in justifying the public's investment in us, I think, but also a commitment to translating our work and justifying our work to the taxpayers who pay our salaries. And, and I think that's, that's something I've really come to admire about public universities. Yeah. Um, I might just say, in terms of the surprise, um, you know, I came to academic life very late, and, and I, I think this is worth saying in the present climate. Uh, as you know, I almost flunked out in my first year. Um, <laughs> what you all don't know is Lori was a TA in the first course I took in graduate school. <laughs> so we've known each other a long time, and I do not use those words lightly. Uh, I truly almost flunked out. Um, so I was, and I had uh, contingent or non-tenure track positions um, until I was 56 years old. I uh, received tenure when I was 60. And I, I really want to say that publicly. This is a time of a lot of anxiety. I was very lucky, very, very lucky, and I had wonderful mentors and supporters, uh, including a husband who, whose job could pay the rent, more than pay the rent. Uh, so I was lucky, but I do, I think this experience uh, continues to make me feel uh, something of an outsider to this enterprise. Yeah. Um, and uh, so. So uh, just following up on that, I think, um, the, as Eric was saying, the intersection of law and religion as the theme that has defined your work, I would say, and maybe you have a different take on it, but it is in a way more accessible to the public. And so would you define that in a way as part and parcel of the public understanding of religion, even though it's more accessible? Or, as you said before, do you think of it as strictly a scholarly enterprise and the public's interest in it is kind of almost accidental? So I, I was, when you sent me, this, so some of these questions, uh, Lori sent me in advance, yeah. and I, thought, I think that's a very interesting question, why um, it might seem that law and religion is somehow among subfields within religious studies more accessible. Um, I find that completely surprising because I think uh, the academic study of law is just as mystifying as the academic study <laughs> of religion to, to most of the so-called public. And um, 
you know, my approach to studying their intersection really comes out of uh, what's called socio-legal studies and, um, and, and critical and social approaches and cultural approaches to understanding religion. So I consider all of this, you know, f fairly pointy-headed. Um, I think, um, but I think what, what your question also made me think about was the fact that I think law has been um, uh, marginalized in the study of religion. Interesting. And, um, and that's for some a set of very interesting reasons, including certain kinds of, um, uh, probably I mean, trends within modernity in terms of separation, modernization, secularization, but also supersessionist um, narratives within Christianity, and so that the uh, that law is 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 relegated to um, and is superseded, um, when, uh, and. Uh, and relegated to Judaism, to Islam. So law in religious studies, I think for most people, is located either in these specific traditions that are considered to be more legalistic, right. and that's considered problematic, yep, yep. Um, or in the special cases like the law of the Sangha um, or the monastic traditions. Um, and otherwise, law is then just secular state law and, is, um, and the word law, the referent, is secular state law. Uh, and that many people in religious studies just accept the state's account of, of law as external and neutral right. and transparent so, and with right. no cultural content. So already we're getting off my list of questions, but if I could just do a follow up there. What's so interesting about what you just said is um, th there's, there's a way in which all of your cases or the ones that you've written about, your, your big books, are places where this question of legal rulings about religion interrupt people's lives. And um, one of the things that I have done in the past is I've taught Winnie's Impossibility of Religious Freedom in my intro to methods class undergrad. And um, I have them do a trial. I, don't, I make them not read the end and promise not to read the outcome. And then I have each theorist of religion try and argue that whatever the um, actual behavior around the graves or the putting of an angel or whatever it is on the graves is, is genuine religion according to their theory. And they are just, they love it. They're totally engaged by it. It's the best thing. They know there's gonna be a big trial at the end and they are crestfallen when they hear the outcome of that case because they think, of course, I'm using theory to defend freedom of religion, which is what I'm supposed to do as an American, no matter who you are and what your politics are. So I'm fascinated because I would say, just thinking about what you were, you were just talking about, about the kind of obscure understanding or the understanding that law is obscure, either within the religious tradition or because it's accepted de facto from, from secular law, I think there's also a kind of element of the trial and of working things out through public reason that is why your books are so uh, compelling, I think, to students. And I don't know if that makes sense to you. No, sure. I mean, I think that the trial is an incredibly appealing and, uh, and familiar from the movies, from TV, and right. stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a format. I, I think it's um, seductive as a way to, because it tends to set up two sides. Yeah, um, which is a problem with the trial itself in real life, as yeah. well as with the Anglo-American trial and, and, and the way it, it uh, conceives of uh, social issues as uh, uh, that kind of binary kind of struggle. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also the question of law as already given in a secular context is analogous to religion as already given in a religious context, and I think your work kind of interrupts both of those in some really interesting ways. Yeah, I mean, it, one thing you say, you know, this interrupts people's lives, but of course, in these cases, people go to the courts. Right. You know, th these are not cases where people are like plucked out. I mean, there are, of course, cases where people are plucked out, and, and uh, but in, mainly in criminal law, but, but these are cases where people came to the court to ask the court to solve their problems. Right, right, right. which has a whole other element to it of theater yes. and healing and public healing and, and that kind of stuff. And yeah, and, and as your students say, and as the potential for you know, failure 
Yes. Over and over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to get back to the theme of failure in your work or failure of, of law and definition in your work a little bit later. Um, but I have to also think a little bit about you and your biography and what the early influences were for you that attracted you to both the law and to the study of religion. And particularly, um, there's a wonderful phrase um, that I learned from somebody who does a social activism NGO called the moment of obligation, like when you realize that you were going to do X. So I'd just love to hear a little bit about your in early influences and when each moment when you turned to law and then when you turned to religion, what those moments were like, or were they cumulative, were they sudden, how did they happen? Um, so I grew up in Uganda, um, in pre-independence Uganda, in Uganda. My parents were anthropologists. I like to say I grew up in anthropology land. Um, <laughs> and I think that's been probably the most pervasive influence on my approach to understanding. Um, I like working close to the ground and working from the ground up. Um, and I think also uh, maybe a, a kind of naive child's appropriation of cultural relativism, possibly, dare I say it, moral relativism. Um, and so I, I think that's, uh, that's really important continues to be important, and, I, and religion is a piece of that. So I've always been interested in religion. I, uh, um, but my first vocational love was the theater, and all through high school and college, I worked in the theater, and I worked for a couple of years professionally in the theater. I'm really a dilettante, <laughs> I, or, I, or I have a short, short attention span or something. Anyway, um, so I, I worked in theater, but then like many people, I went to law school because I just, the theater, I wasn't talented enough, and I wasn't willing to put up with it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I went to law school because my best friend's father said I should go to law school. That's, <laughs> I think why lots of people go to law school, actually. And um, so, and, and then came to religion in an interesting way. So after I quit practicing law, um, and this is you know, part of the sort of a women's story of this, at that time my firm wouldn't let me work part time. And so I quit and went back to school. Um, but the reason I went to study religion, I'd, I've been interested in religion all, all along, is that um, I was invited. This was a wonderful, just amazing opportunity uh, that was given me by um, a law professor of mine who's also been a mentor to many, many people. His name's Stan Katz, um, very well-known legal historian at uh, Princeton University, who was the president of the ACLS. He's been a very influential in uh, promoting the humanities and the study of the humanities. Um, but I just, by chance, happened to have him as a law professor early in his career. And when he knew that I was unemployed and a young mom, uh, he invited me to be part of this Princeton project on church and state. It was funded by the Lilly Foundation. And he invited me to write this chapter on uh, church and state law in the United States from the Civil War for this bigger um, and, and so I did this uh, research into, it's a bibliographical essays. And, and, and what I realized in reading this was that everybody who wrote about religion and law from a religi religious standpoint seemed to really not understand the law. And of course, I was a lawyer at that point. And the people from the law side, whether they were uh, legal scholars or judges or lawyers, really seem to be totally clueless about religion. And I, so I, I thought, you know, well, this is maybe an opportunity for somebody. Yeah. Um, and so I applied to the University of Chicago Divinity School to find out more about religion. That's great. So um, can and I And then I met you. And then, right, the rest is history. Can I get back to something that you said just now? Someone invited you, a senior scholar invited you to do an article for the Princeton Project on Church and State when you were a young mom, were you still practicing law at the time or you had just left your firm? I had just left my firm. That is an amazing act and that I think would be the difference between what I call mentorship versus sponsorship. At mentorship, you're sort of passively there in a good way. Sponsorship is like, I don't care, you are great. I'm going to give you opportunities no matter what your quote unquote profile is. So that's itself an amazing gesture at that moment. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the other phrase that you use that I'm interested in is 
um, a child's appropriation of cultural and perhaps moral relativism. I, I really would love to hear more about what you mean by that and, and um, how you think about that now. Well, so um, uh, this is the 1950s and um, before, <laughs> before post-colonialism, um, before a, a kind of critique of anthropology. So I think that, um, so naive perhaps in that sense. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I've now read Mamdani and can do an analysis of the kind of power situation and the structural um, kinds of um, methods and modes of the British um, in East Africa and, and what long-term effects they've had. Um, but so I say naive in the sense that this is where I lived. I, I didn't know any other place. So, um, and, and we were uh, living on the campus of McCary College, which is, uh, uh, to, so I think I, I, had, I was exposed through my parents and through uh, the experience of living in a, in, in a college community in East Africa just to a kind of acceptance of difference that was, right. I mean, I don't want to sort of take on myself some kind of, uh, it, it, I think it really was very practical, it's just that I had that opportunity. Yeah, did you go on um, quote unquote field research with your parents? Yeah, so that people imagine that, you know, if you did this, you lived in the bush. Right. Um, yes, my father was a political anthropologist. He studied um, the political uh, bureaucracy of the southern Bantu kingdoms. Um, so this was like everybody wears clothes in this project, him <laughs> and them, and you know, they're, they're politicians and bureaucrats, and he's uh, <laughs> interested uh, in studying them. So right. we did go. Uh, you know, on vacations out in the right. country. We didn't. But your field was a classroom in the institutions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, so uh, turning a little bit to um, your work. So I'm thinking of paying the words extra, the impossibility uh, of religious freedom and prison religion. Um, we were just talking about the fact that the work is organized around court cases that are difficult, fascinating, intractable, and um, several of which you participate in as an expert witness. And so uh, that, we heard about that a little bit in your introduction. That's a, a very public act and a really interesting one from my perspective because I, I think of it as an act of public service. Um, I think if, you, for, so first it's a basic thing, can you turn it down? You can turn it down if you're asked to be a, an expert witness, correct? Oh, of course. Yeah, and so you chose to say no, I wanna work on these. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how that, those acts, and I'm, I think they're different in each of your books, um, sparked the ideas for the books. And feel free, I mean, I think we all are here because we're so interested in your work, so feel free to talk about each of those cases, because each one is really, really different. And in each case, your expert testimony um, showed a different angle of that intersection between religion and law. Yeah, so the, um, the Florida case, um, uh, and this is the way it happens. I'm just sitting in my office and I get a call from a lawyer and who, who wants uh, someone to testify. And um, in, in this case, um, you know, he described the case a little bit. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know the case, um, it's, uh, one of the things I like, let me just say first, one of the, things I, one of the reasons I'm attracted, I think, by writing about um, trials and cases is that it does kind of throw up ordinary religion. Yeah. So I think that many people in religious studies have and tend to study, uh, you know, sort of um, the virtuosos of the tradition. Um, whereas, um, this is partly because it's in the U.S., but you, this is ordinary religious life. And one of the things I like about the Boca Raton case is these are ordinary American Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. So there's nothing exotic here. It's not about, you know, whether something exotic is a religion. This is everyday religious life of Americans. That's one thing I really like. Anyway, so this guy was an ACLU lawyer who'd volunteered his time to represent a group of people 
whose relatives were buried in um, the city cemetery. And uh, the city cemetery had a rule that uh, the only memorialization you could place on the grave, and it had to be about you know, the size of eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, and it had to be flush with the ground to enable uh, maintenance um, through mowing over it. And over a period of about 15 years, um, several hundred of these graves had sort of sprouted um, you know, decorations um, that were homemade decorations. And um, a, a point then came when the city decided to start enforcing the regulations and remove all them. And um, there was a period of, of some negotiation, but eventually uh, the ACLU brought a lawsuit on behalf of these plaintiffs uh, arguing that this was a violation of the then new Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, so he called and said that, you know, so he needed somebody to testify that what these people were doing on these graves was religious. And, uh, and, and this uh, sort of, my relationship to the, him and to the trial changed over time, so initially, I was just going to fly down to Boca Raton and you know, do an hour's testimony and fly back to Chicago. Um, but as I got to know him and I got to realize that he actually didn't know anything about religion at all, <laughs> he was an ACLU lawyer who'd done mainly free speech and other kinds of cases, very interesting, very, very competent trial room lawyer. Um, I became almost a sort of teacher to him, sort of teaching him um, and uh, and so that, that was lucky for me, because I got to spend the whole, to watch the whole trial, and that was just yeah. serendipitous, yeah. really. And it was being in the courtroom and seeing and experiencing the sort of three-dimensional aspects of, this gets, this is the theater aspect here, yeah. you know, the three-dimensional aspects in the courtroom of these various people trying to speak religion in different ways and the ways in which those incompatible ways of doing religion um, were being enacted in front of me, I guess is one way to say that. And when you started, and I want to get to prison religion in a second, but when you started um, and at testifying, you didn't have a sense of the impossibility of religious freedom at that point and the murkiness of defining it was it textual was it not and putting an angel on the grave was not essential to catholic identity all the stuff that you write about in the book you hadn't gotten there yet as an expert witness well i mean i the paying words extra has some of that yeah but i already did that work but that's a, a supreme court case and in that case i was talking from reading texts, uh, uh, reading opinions about right. the differences among Supreme Court justices. So right. already that notion that there's multiple models here yeah. and they can't be resolved. But I, I don't think it was till I was in the courtroom in, in Boca Raton that the, that the sort of intractability, sort of existential intractability of this became as apparent. Right. And it was really after I began to reflect on that, yes. And it was after you testified and you were yes. still watching the case and over and over again, it's hitting you. And then one of the things that's powerful in the book, of course, is that the, the judge doesn't ever seem to get it. And that's one of the things that my students just, you know, go, they, they're very annoyed with that, that whole interaction. How did you, did, was this something as you were watching the trial, you were thinking, this is even a deeper instantiation of what I saw in paying the words extra? Or did it depress you? Did it? You know, do you like, ah, I get it now, this is my, this is my thesis only really no, exemplified? No, I, I really didn't. Uh, oh, first let me say, actually I think the judge did get it. Mm. I think this is really important to say. Mm. The judge did get it, better than anybody else in that room. So the judge says um, repeatedly that this is the United States, Everybody has, can have whatever religion they want. He totally respects them. Yeah. They're all, you know, and he really means it. Yeah. And he, he, he loves each one of them. <laughs> but he understands, I think, better than anybody else in this room, that what he's getting from us, the five, five scholars of religion, is not helpful to him. 
Yeah. In fact, you know, as I yeah. say in prison religion, I, yep. I'd say it's not relevant. Yep. This is the insight. I mean, the, yes, we all were, some of us, other than me at that point, are, were really prominent uh, scholars of religion, and, uh, but we were kind of irrelevant to what. And so that in the end, it was really left to him to um, figure out some way that uh, this law, which is, uh, promises too much, could be curtailed. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, yeah. Yeah, it, it, interesting. And I think just getting to the transition into prison religion, you had, when you started writing prison religion, you had finished the impossibility for the most part. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so moving into that project, tell me what was compelling for you about A, be engaged in those, those court cases, and B, um, what you think you could have learned differently, or what was a new angle for you, given the kind of work that you were doing in your first two books? So I didn't take either of these on as calculated to be something that I would use. Yeah. I wouldn't regard that as ethical yeah. um, to uh, testify simply for my intellectual curiosity. Right. Um, uh, the, the second case, uh, the prison case is different because of course it's an establishment cause case. So for those of you who know the US Constitution, um, there are two kinds of cases. There are free exercise cases and there are establishment clause cases. Right. And I, th I think establishment clause cases are actually intellectually more interesting. Hmm. Um, the problem of disestablishment is a more interesting problem. Um, uh, but again, you know, it's sort of a random call from a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and in that case, so by this time, I'm getting a little more skeptical about what, uh, what we can do. Right. And I don't do this anymore. Interesting. And I wouldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And I don't think we should do it. Um, but, um, but this was a lawyer, a uh, young lawyer who'd never tried a case before, two young lawyers who'd never tried a case before. And they were representing um, uh, a group of prisoners who, uh, in, a, in Iowa, who were suing, uh, protesting a, the Iowa State uh, Corrections uh, contract with Prison Fellowship Ministries, which is uh, evangelical prison ministry. And um, uh, yeah, again, I get drawn into, I think the, be the best part about this expert witness is the teaching the lawyer part. Yeah. The actual testifying in court I think is deeply problematic for, uh, for what we know. Um, because what, we don't know what they want to know. Right. So in the prison case, what they want to know is, is what's happening in this prison an establishment of religion? That's a legal question. That's not a, uh, an academic question. Right. Um, so we can't answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you feel about the outcome of that case relative to the, the Boca Raton case? Uh, well, that, that judge was a really smart judge, a really different judge. Um, the way I feel about prisons is that our prison system is so comprehensively, comprehensively broken and so comprehensively appalling um, that uh, whether or not this particular in-prison program is inflected by uh, evangelical biblicism I think is really not important. Yeah. I, I tend to think that these questions, where we're arguing about whether something's religious or not, uh, really masks larger social issues that we're not addressing. Interesting. And just going back to something you said earlier, um, my guess is people with us who are interested in the study of law and religion would have interesting thoughts to say about why establishment cases are more interesting than freedom cases, so I, I really w would love to hear you elaborate more on why you find them more interesting and what's exciting Well, in about part, them. it's because it's, it's what's distinctive about the American arrangement. Um, so 
you know, the management of religious life um, in most countries in the world is done through some kind of ministry of religious affairs. And it's possible to actually sort of locate what counts as legal relig religion as opposed to what's not. Now, you could argue with, you know, whether that's a good dividing up of the pie, but actually there's someone in charge. And, and we made a decision not to have anybody in charge. Yeah. And, and that's what sets up the problem of um, free religion or disestablished religion in the US. So it continues to be legally enabled in many, many ways. Um, but it is not, but because we, are, uh, we were from the beginning so anxious about the problem of the Church of England and yeah. the, the captured church, right. we sort of set the church free and it, um, it is in this sort of unstable situation and in which we can't locate it and we're anxious about locating it. And we're always locating and it. And we're somewhere. always locating yeah. it, right, yeah. yes. It's fascinating. And this is not on the script, I'm gonna riff a little just to warn you. Um, so you've also become a go-to person for American religion. More broadly, people, you write articles that talk about American religion in different places, always with this view. But what you just said really sparked something for me, which is, I think you put your finger on something very interesting about American religious identity, um, in that it's kind of, because we're always litigating it, we also almost always need to declare it or figure out whether it's established or not established, et cetera. And I think that's another aspect of your work that I think has really contributed to the public study of religion is, in a way, the way we become religious or include other religions as scholars that I know you've worked with that have also argued is by, through court cases, you know, over time. Right, um, yes, I mean, I do think this, it's important that this changes um, in the mid 20th century. So it, it, it's very important not to, to see this as uniform over American history. So yeah. certainly in the, in the, early, the antebellum period, in the early federal period, um, there are specific issues about how uh, religious societies, as they called them then, would, would get organized. I mean, they sort of had to invent a way for uh, churches and other kinds of religious societies to own property, to contract, to do these things, to have legal personality. And that was a kind of new project that Americans had to work on. But this is done mainly through state law up mm -hmm. until the mid 20th century. And that's important. So there's a lot of variation across the country. And it's not until the mid 20th century that this becomes a national project. Mm -hmm. And it is when it becomes a national project and the school prayer cases that the problem of federalism also is made so evident. Right. So we have the, the, the dual problem of the tension between the free exercise and the disestablishment clause, which is always overpromising what it can't yeah. deliver, and the problem of federalism and the tension between the states and the national government. And, and so these, this also creates a constant tension. Um, and the experiment from, say, 1940 to 1990 to have a federal policy as run by the U.S. Supreme Court, like we now know that didn't work, right. and so we're <laughs> we've backed off that, and now we're back to uh, to, to something else. Yeah, um, and it's related to something that really struck me in your conclusion to Prison of Religion, which is you argue that any theory of the rule of law must also imply a theory of religion, and so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because I think it's really relevant to your overall work and your rece receiving of this award. And that's the first part of the question. And the second is, would you, uh, one might also say the opposite, that any theory of religion must also imply a theory of law. So would you agree with that or not? So talk to me about those two things. Yeah, so I guess this is just part of my general project of trying to get these things back together and, um, and not to accept you know, separationism as, as the natural state of affairs, I think. Um, so I think law and religion are ubiquitous in human societies. It's something people do, is do law and they do religion, and, um, and maybe even beyond human society. Um, elephants have rituals of mourning, and there were ways to think about that legally and religiously. Um, so, you know, so I would begin from that. And so you know, for religious studies scholars, we can almost always tell a religion story, right, about any kind of particular uh, event. 
as a law scholar, I can always tell a law story, law story. right? Yeah. And, so, and these are always intertwined. And so I think um, uh, backing off not just what we know how to do in religious studies, which is back off sort of world religions, uh, you know, capital, capital letters, um, uh, religions, we know how to back this. We need to back off having state law be uh, the only uh, kind of law that we think about. There's always law, and it's something that people like Robert Cover have taught us, um, and, uh, and state law is only one kind of law. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the early Indian distinction between custom and law, and there is a, a definite difference. Um, stuff that people always do is right. literally what the what the Sanskrit is, sarachara, and um, or ongoing truth of, of regular practice almost. Um, and Jewish law has similar kinds of distinctions and so on. And I'm wondering, sometimes it seems like a lot of the murky conceptual areas that you expose in your work has to do with that really interesting place between custom or customary perception and law. And I would love for you to think with us a, so it was those socio-legal scholars who try to sort of expand the field of law and expand our imagination about what law is so that we can um, uh, see more clearly how law operates in society would see, you know, so custom, but also something like the law of the bus queue um, <laughs> or, uh, or the supermarket line. Yeah. Um, also, though, something like the court of public opinion, the, the informal law, and I think one thing that's really important about informal law is it has real, consequences. Um, pardon me? Consequences. Not just consequences, it has uh, the capacity to punish people, uh. right, so, and, and coercive power. Uh. So it, it, it's not that just the state is the only monopolizer yeah. of coercive power. These other forms of law also have coercive power, the law of, 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 so any one person is impinged upon by various right. legal regimes. Yeah, um, so I think this custom law distinction is one that is valuable um, in a, for political reasons in a particular right. context, right? right? Yeah. Just as the good religion, bad religion. religion. Yeah, or is, magic and religion or any of those. Or other, yeah. superstitio, or yep. we could go back to Roman law too. Yeah. Yes. Very, very interesting. So I, I was really looking forward to asking this question. Not at all surprised that we, we don't have as much time as I had hoped to, but among the many reasons why I'm particularly drawn to your work is um, you have such poignant human stories in them, and you don't necessarily dwell on them, but you do mention them. So for instance, in the Boca Raton case, you know, the families whose uh, graves are have little children on them to accompany the child who died uh, and like how a city law could ask family to take that off I mean that's part of the poignancy of the case um, or the angels and, or the Virgin Mary and the role of um, uh, the, the Virgin Mary as a, a, well, a way of helping the family through the grief you know that's there um, and the other uh, in prison religion you talk a lot about uh, there was one person who was af afraid in his testimony said he's afraid to pray, or shy. He's shy about praying in public, and so when you have an evangelical program, you know, it's, there, there are, in these cases, very human moments that I think create also a compelling nature to the scholarship. It makes the scholarship even more compelling, I'd say, because it is on the ground, as, as you put it. And I'm wondering if you um, could answer the question of what the most poignant human moment was in your, in your work. No. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, but I, I, I'd like to think of that as a really quite, as a principled answer in the sense that um, I really think there's poignancy to the ways in which in all of these cases, law and religion fails yeah. um, together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I thought, you know, you mentioned that question when you sent me the questions, uh, so I might just talk about a case I'm thinking about right now, about something I'm writing, the um, case uh, Hosanna Tabor, which was a Supreme Court decision from 2012. Um, this was a case of a fourth grade teacher who taught at a parochial school, a Lutheran parochial school in Michigan. And um, 
she became uh, she came, she she came down with a chronic illness over the summer. She took a, a leave of absence. Uh, she was uh, diagnosed, and she had a doctor's letter. She came back to school in January, uh, ready for her job, and and she ended up being fired. And and this case is so. Uh, in this case, um, she loses at every turn, you know, and and it ends up to being this kind of. A clash between church and state, and she's the one who loses. Loses, mm -hmm. um, and you have both the church um, firing a disabled woman from her job, and you have the United States government deciding that um, churches have a kind of religious freedom, to, a kind of sovereignty, which allows them to, you know, uh, manage their own employment without. Uh, observing the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's just such a, a tragic failure. It's a, and it's a case that's celebrated by certain people in, uh, in the religious freedom community as an example of a, a strong assertion of religious freedom on behalf of religious communities. Right. Um, and, and some of my favorite writing about that case is from people within advocates for religious freedom saying, you know, guys, we gotta look at this. There's something wrong when we, as religious people, are celebrating um, the n denial of uh, rights to a disabled woman. Yeah, where the outcome is unjust on many yes. different levels. Yeah. And so both yeah. church law and and state law fails her in that right. in that case. Yeah. Yes. Powerful. And um, I, I also will say that your most recent book, The Ministry of Presence. Um, also has some some wonderful narratives in it, and but it also feels like a little bit of a departure. Yeah, and so say more about how it feels different than your uh, earlier work. And um, a, well, a little... part of it's just a problem of writing. So, writing books about a single case just organize a book in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, so it's really important to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I kind of got got the hang of that. Right. Um, got the formula. <laughs> But I also try and wanted, I was also kind of tired about, of the Constitution and the sort of problems of the Constitution. And I wanted to see uh, how ordinary law, ordinary bureaucratic law shaped religion. And so, um, yeah. so that's what I, I take the exercise of that book to be. Um, and um, I don't know if you know a wonderful book um, about uh, Indian charitable endowments called uh, by Franklin Pressler um, about the management. That I think that's one of the most wonderful books uh, and deeply inspired me when I wrote wrote that book. But the ways in which the kind of ordinary ways of law, not these more sort of spectacular constitutional mm -hmm. arguments, but the ordinary ways of law shape how religion changes. And, and so that's what interested me there. And particularly in the, in the life of the chaplain or in the work of the chaplain. Well, I, so I, in that book, I, I show how law about educational institutions, law about um, the military, about hospitals, about hospital management, hospital assessment. I mean, all of these accumulation of rules and regulations which make up our rule-bound lives um, also shape religion. So yeah. it's, yeah. And the, the uh, other thing that struck me about that book is that it seemed more Weberian in the sense that it's focused on a religious figure or, uh, and the different ways in which a religious figure could be inflected in society and, and vice versa. And in that way, uh, very, very different than your earlier work too. Yeah, I became really fascinated by the figure of the chaplain. I had started out thinking that that book was um, more of a sort of Foucauldian spiritual governance kind of book. Right. And um, the more I learned about the chaplain, the more interested I became in the chaplain. And since I wrote that book, it's even become a more, a clearer phenomenon that the chaplain, the important, the increase in the number of chaplains, not just in the U.S., but around the world, and the sort of indispensable uh, nature of the chaplain's role as a kind of broker between the secular and the religious. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really fascinating, yeah. And also a, a freelance negotiator. Yes. Which uh, was a whole new model for me to think about because you you actually think of chaplains as deeply rule-bound, but as you say, and part of the argument of the book is that there are so many rules 
that they end up actually being freer in, in an odd way and that they have to move between them. Well, and apparently the chaplain, uh, the, uh, the people who are attracted to the chaplaincy are people who don't want the bishop looking over their shoulder. Right. So they want to be working in an institution other than the church. And, they, and the, so they're an outsider to both, yeah. right. And, and that allows them a, some space of, of free. Freedom. Yes, yes. Freedom. very interesting. Yeah. Um, so we're going to turn it over for, I'm sure, really wonderful questions. But before we do, um, so we've talked about public study of religion in, in several different ways. And we have, I know, in, in um, the Public Understanding Committee. But um, you can think about it as first someone who, someone who com becomes interested in this idea of the public understanding of religion as someone who wants to leave a more specialized career for a more publicly accessible one, however we define that, whether it's through law or not. Um, or you could think of it as um, people who want to begin studying the role of religion in the public sphere, s square. Um, and there are many other ways to define it, but those are two broad areas. Um, your work has been significant in both of those areas um, in all the ways that we, we've just been talking about. I'm wondering if you have any advice for the young, middle-aged, or about-to-retire scholar who thinks about either of those moves and um, how you might give advice for the person who's making that shift. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, I'm not sure what the public understanding or the public sphere mean. Um, I, I do, th and I am obviously deeply anxious about this word religion. So, um, I, I think I would, if, if, if a student came to me who was interested in a non-academic non career, whether an undergraduate or a graduate student, and um, I would really want to know more about, very specifically, about what they meant by that and what kind of career they envision. Um, I, I don't know that I can say very much more than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I would just want to take my cues from them. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very reluctant to say that um, Yes, that, that, that one could make a career of the public understanding of mm. this thing that we don't know what it is. Right, yes. right, right. Although, also, I think part of that resistance would come in addition from wanting to make it, because the public understanding is imbued, at least for some people who think about it, in many ways like a public university is, uh, in terms of service to the broader public. Yeah, but I can think of so many different ways that, that service, I mean, a, a person might um, you know, be wanting to um, help immigrants or, um, or you know, do chaplaincy kind of work, do work with, um, you know, I, 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 um, I'm not sure, you know, for reasons of all the things I write about, I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to use the word religion to organize anything. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, yeah. So I guess I'm going to resist your question. No, that's okay. That's good. <laughs> um, and and I also think creating a um, a field where people get PhDs is a particular way of organizing this kind of knowledge that I think many of the people who are involved in this conversation would want to resist as well. Uh, and so I, I I think the point is a very good one in all sorts of ways. Um, so I guess I'll just end before we open it up by saying um, you made the joke that I was your TA a long time ago. Um, I, I think that the tables have rather turned as to who is teaching who. Um, and you have taught us so much in the, in the broader uh, field of the study of religion. Um, you've created incredibly compelling books um, that have the wealth of a specialist but also the kind of uh, human interest of, of you know, a really well-told story with theater. Um, and so I just want to thank you again for the great contributions you've made, and uh, we can open it up. So. So. Uh, I, I, before we do, I'd just like to also do some thanks here. Um, thank you to the uh, Committee on Public Understanding of Religion. I'm really honored by this uh, award um, and thank you for uh, Laurie it's really fun to talk again and it's when we've talked over the years of course but um, I I'm really 
uh, grateful for the way you prepared for this and your engagement with my work. Um, and yeah, I could say thank you to many more people, but I don't think I will right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So open it up. Further thanks, queries, definitional enthusiasms. We flattened them. And I might not be able to see. Hi. Here, let me, oh, I think we're doing the past microphone here. Yeah, since we're sitting in uh, halls in which we are thinking about the study of religion and academic study of religion, particularly underneath such a overwhelming banner as this. <laughs> you know, the banners are To think about, and, and you said that you're particularly interested and engaged in thinking about the study of religion in public universities. And I'm wondering about what, what more you have to say about um, boundary issues in particular. And you've certainly taught me a great deal that in my own understanding of the way I articulate the development of the academic study of religion in public institutions, that I probably overemphasize the place of constitutional law and the Shemp decision being, I suppose, the, the place where that's most prominent. What, what are the boundaries? In, in thinking about particularly public institutions, um, to think about the, the, the boundaries that limit, or if that's the right term, the academic study of religion in public institutions, where are those boundaries really firm? Where are, those, where are there holes in the boundary that we might not be necessarily aware of? And maybe to move to a normative perspective, where do you think there should be holes and shouldn't be holes? Mm -hmm. uh, so, as, as you are alluding to, David, and we've talked about before, um, I think that the, uh, the boundaries are, that the, the Shemp, the, the, to, to uh, use the Shemp decision, uh, which was, as you know, about Bible teaching, Bible reading in public schools, uh, not about universities um, is really problematic, and 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 but it is used to set up this distinction between teaching religion and teaching about religion. Um, uh, I have come to think that this distinction is not one that we can defend. Um, I think it's incoherent, and um, and I don't think we should do it anymore. Um, and I think that the boundaries um, about what we should be doing in the classroom in public universities and other universities uh, can be defended on pedagogical grounds, um, not on uh, grounds uh, of the, some invented distinction between theology and, uh, and religious studies. Um, so I think, I think the most interesting work today in, in academic scholarship and the most interesting teaching and the teaching that is mo of most interesting to students is along this boundary, so-called boundary, or plays with whether there is a boundary. Um, I think students are impatient with this uh, teaching religion, teaching about religion distinction, and I don't think it makes any sense. That doesn't mean it'll be easy, but no teaching's easy, and it's especially these days. Um, so we have to admit those questions into our classroom. Otherwise, we really, I think we really marginalize ourselves. Um, I mean, if we make a boundary around religion, uh, we won't be talking to anybody who's worth, or that's interesting, who's interested. Mm. We won't be talking about important things. Mm. How's that? <laughs> Pretty strong. can't see very well, so if you, there's a good, there, over there. Would you accept that there's a distinction between talking about art as something that some people do and talking about art as a practice? That's what, what's what I, what um, I, the distinction I make when I'm talking to, to parents and students is that a religious studies department is not trying to make um, people be good practitioners of religion. We're trying to explain what it, the practitioners of religion are about. And the comparison I make is with um, 
a sports program that's trying to teach people to be good at basketball or good at tennis, and people who want to explain the history and social significance and what have you of those sports or of sport. And similarly with art, there's a distinction between teaching art as a, an activity, making art, and teaching about art, which is the history and theory of art. And I think that those, I'm not yet persuaded by you that those are not valid distinctions. They may not, they may be difficult to hold in a legal context, and maybe that's what you're trying to say, but I'm not convinced that they're not um, valid in an educational context. So as Laurie points out, those are the same context in the United States. Um, in other words, um, as David mentioned, um, uh, religious st studies uh, scholars in the United States understand themselves to be legally bound to make that distinction. So um, it is the legal that defines, in that, in that case, the distinction. So I'll just say that about the U.S. context, so that, um, that the educational uh, project in public universities is legally defined then. Um, but, uh, but but putting aside uh, the legal issues um, for a moment, I think um, I think intellectually, actually, it is fairly difficult to defend the line that you're talking about. Um, that um, uh, you know, historically, I mean, I'm no scholar of art, but there's you know, art classes where you make art, and then there's art classes where you study the history of art or the aesthetics of art or something like that. These are ways we carve up. Um, uh, you know, knowledge into, into sort of manageable bits that we can organize universities. But I think that in the um, experience of any one person, um, these things are actually much more blended. Um, and I think that's true across the disciplines and across the fields. And I think that's true in terms of uh, the way that people in religious studies um, imagine religious practitioners as kind of bounded and uh, sort of maybe unreflective and um, not porous to other forms of knowledge and other forms of um, being and acting in the world. And, and, I, and, what, and that's what concerns me. Um, there are certain things you sh that I would argue would be more or less appropriate. And I understand, that, I mean, the reason for the parents' concern is political, uh, right? The reason for the parents' concern is not uh, conceptual. It's, it's, it, it's not our problem. It's a problem created by the, the politics of religion right now in, in, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, but but, but there's my anxiety I... about um, uh, uh, religious influence. Follow up, and then we'll go to another yeah, question. Yeah, um, but but another thing, another reason that parents have concern is not political; it's also religious. They don't want their children, who they're raising as Catholic or Jewish or evangelical, perhaps, being exposed to dangerous ideas like Muslim or Buddhist or pagan ideas. I mean, that is a an issue I we understand, often. I understand. I understand that. You know, but you know, going but, to school is a dangerous thing. And um, <laughs> yes, thank you. you know, I think one of the problems with this too much focus on these religious issues is, you know, uh, parents should be pretty anxious about what they're learning in history class as well. Um, <laughs> That's a good point. Yes, hi. Well, thank you both for a wonderful session. Um, Winnie, of course, this is your fan club here, but <laughs> what is it like? Is your work appreciated? H have you sown seeds in the law and society, law yeah. and culture world. Have you had the same impact there as you've had here? That's number mm -hmm. one. Number two, are you prepared to reveal what is in the pipeline for your <laughs> next book? I happen to n have just met with the person holding the proofs, of Alan Thomas, of what's next in the pipeline. So, so yeah, those are two great questions. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know that I'm in a position to, to comment on, you know, the reception of my work. Um, I think one of the things that happens when you write a book is it just goes out there in the world and it has a life of its own, and um, that's especially true of the impossibility book, and I sometimes meet it coming around the corner and I don't <laughs> recognize it. So, um, 
I, I haven't been uh, particularly integrated into the very s specific sort of uh, brotherhood of the First Amendment, and I <laughs> use that term carefully. Um, but that's fine. Um, they have a different project. Um, but I, I, I am engaged in conversations in the socio-legal community more broadly in mm. the anthropology of law and, uh, and law and literature movement. So yeah, I've had conversations there, I would say. Um, so uh, Pamela and Paul Johnson and I just uh, uh, wrote a collective three-authored book, which is uh, a strenuous activity, and we're still mm. friends. Um, uh, for a series from uh, Chicago uh, called Trios, in which three, uh, three authors uh, write uh, separate essays and then a joint introduction on a single uh, concept. Uh, our volume uh, is called Ecclesia, and it is, I'll just give it a one sentence uh, little boost here. Um, it's, um, so the three of us, Pamela writes about Canada, I write about the US, and Paul writes about Brazil. Uh, so this is a, a kind of American repost to, pol to political theology written from a European perspective. Um, and it's an effort to try and show how political theology, when it travels uh, to the Americas, looks different and why. Um, so that's one thing that's in the pipeline literally about to be birthed. That's right. That's great. Yeah. Other questions? There was one over there. Oh, I should also say, I guess, um, since I'm supposed to say, uh, there's also a second edition of Impossibility, which is in the pi pipeline. That's, that's yeah. the corner that you met it coming around, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, a colleague and I actually created a course in our small liberal arts college on called Religion and Law that uses, <clears throat> excuse me, Impossibility as a centerpiece. So I'd be interested to hear what the second edition is including. That's not my question. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about um, the students in that class. And at one point, you made a distinction. You said what happened in that Establishment Clause case was a legal question. It wasn't an academic question. I think I know what you meant. But I'm trying to imagine how I'd, I would explain that to my students. Um, because I think they would hear that as sort of saying, um, in saying it's a legal question, it's a practical question with real world consequences. And an academic question makes it That's fun right. to think about, but kind of silly. I, I, I couldn't don't quite hear the last mean. part of what you said, and there's a light going right. I can't see oh, you I'm at sorry. all. Oh, I'm sorry. That's OK. Um, if, you need to look, if you need to look away, <laughs> avert your eyes. Um, I'm trying to imagine how I would explain the distinction you made between a legal question and an academic question to undergraduate students, who I think would hear saying, well, it's a legal question as being analogous to saying it's a practical question with real world consequences and saying it's an academic question with saying it's kind of fun to think about, but okay, maybe a little yeah, silly. Okay, I, I got you, I got, got you, it? yeah, no. yeah. So that isn't exactly the distinction I would make. Um, I, I think that the academic and the legal are different enterprises, but um, in some ways, although of course they're uh, related and they're overlapping. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., as I said, because we don't have a ministry of religious affairs and we don't have anybody who's in charge of what counts as religion, um, uh, we have, in effect, um, given that task to the people, if you want to speak sort of politically in terms of American political theology. Uh, one of the problems with expert testimony is, um, and expertise generally in the U.S., is that expertise is greatly suspect probably good reasons. And so the expert witness, whether the expert witness is speaking about uh, religion or something else, is, is known to be somebody that juries, for example, are deeply skeptical about. Um, so I think that um, in, in making this distinction, I want to both make a distinction um, which has to do with, um, uh, in a technical sense, with what the question is in a legal case. So the question in a legal case is what this statute means. And that's a legal question for the judge to decide. And expert witnesses cannot be, cannot testify about law. They can only testify, testify about sort of facts, so to speak. Um, so I think that, that that's 
in a technical legal sense, the words of the statute are legal questions. So I don't think it's a question, so the way in which uh, the academic enterprise would enter into the collective project, American project of democratically deciding what should count as religion or how religious life should be managed in the United States would be, I would say, through the ordinary things we do, which is teaching. And these people then become lawyers and judges and juries and legislators, and they, and so that's our role, I would say, not to testify in cases. Is that helpful? It is, thank you. Sure. Hey. Thank you, that was a wonderful conversation. So I recently taught a religion and law course with a, a Canadian colleague, Ben Berger, uh, and it was very exciting when we were reading some Supreme Court cases, Canadian Supreme Court cases, and there, there was Ben being cited by the judges, and he, his work was, so that's a whole other kind of public understanding of religion, right, or a Supreme Court understanding of religion, which filters out to the public in some way. So have you been cited by Supreme Court justices? <laughs> and if so, how do you feel about that? So this is a perfect example of the difference between the United States and other places <laughs> like Canada, which doesn't have disestablishment, among other things. Um, you know, I think that um, Ben is a friend, and he's also um, a constitutional law professor um, who has clerked on the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, so he's an influ influential voice, and of course, um, the Supreme Court in this country mainly cites law professors. Uh, um, no, but what I, what I write about is not helpful to them. They don't want to hear that um, religion can't be, is incoherent, and that's just not useful to them, and uh, mm -hmm. that's fine. Uh, but I would like, can I just tell one example, a really interesting example of um, a scholar sort of being incorporated into constitutional law. So in South Africa, um, so the South African anthropologist John Komaroff, um, who's a very prominent uh, legal anthropologist, uh, early in his career wrote a splendid book called Rules and Processes, which I would recommend to anybody who wants to think about law anthropolog anthropologically, which is really about uh, the way in which customary law in South Africa um, is, uh, adjusts to, to change over time, and how there are rules, but there are also always ways to get around rules, always, in all legal systems. It's a, an extremely interesting book. It has now become um, incorporated into the training of lawyers and, and mm -hmm. judges, and it's, it's in effect part of South African law. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the, a recent case um, in South Africa that came out of um, uh, one of the uh, African communities that had a dispute over the chieftainship, um, and they had one of the, the, the leading candidate for chief was a woman, and they'd never had a woman chief. And apparently, you know, the law was, would not admit of that. And John's book is cited wow. for saying, actually, no, that's what customary law can do that. They know how to change. And so it's, a, it's an interesting example of the way in which scholarship can be kind of taken up as yeah. uh, in favor of legal change, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more question, and it's... This is, this is just a comment. I don't know about the Supreme Court, but I was in the, during the previous administration, I was in a West Wing meeting. It was about religion determining who could get what funds from where. So I laid out this beautiful argument from, uh, from our honoree today, and uh, it, was, it was lots of fun. And then after my 20 minute exposition of impossibility and whatnot, huh. <laughs> they said, oh yes, we are, here's a quote, we're well aware of Ms. Winifred Fowler Sullivan's work. It's just that we don't have the luxury of living at the 30,000 foot level. We have to make decisions tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, well, don't cancel my last 20 minute argument, but uh, you know, I think this will help you along. <laughs> so people are reading you uh, in the West Wing or the previous administration. So. <laughs> Back but to I, the anxiety. Probably not in this West Wing. They may have been reading me, but they weren't understanding me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was quick, so we'll do one more to anyway. I'm Adam, and uh, I'm a PhD student in my third, in my fourth year, actually. Um, I'm 35 years old. I've spent uh, basically the last decade of my life studying and working and teaching 
about this incoherent thing we call religion. Um, and what I love about your work is how practical it is and how down to earth it is. And it's actually encouraged me to, to think about things in a very practical way. Um, and so I'm curious, I, I, oh, over the last couple of days at AAR, there's been kind of this specter about the job market and about kind of the precarity that comes along with higher ed right now. Um, and I have to admit, it gives me some anxiety to hear somebody who was just given an award um, kind of say you're hesitant about organizing anything around this idea of religion, which for me includes departments, includes um, and the academic, the American Academy of Religion, things like that. So um, I'll admit that I have a huge stake in trying to provide some coherence to this incoherent thing. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about what your argument, what kind of implications your argument might have for the study of religion long term if it's taken up, um, and my prospects to getting a job after all this craziness. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I don't know if you were here at the beginning when I said that precarity has characterized my own career. Um, but, um, so, and I'm deeply sympathetic, I think. Um, You know, I think that uh, the current situation in colleges and universities in this country and other places is, one, is, is that we're in the midst of rapid change. And, um, and it's not just religious studies. Um, and I think that the, I, with, with respect to religious studies in particular, um, it's, it's highly contingent that we have religious studies departments. And I'm sure you know Th that history. So I, I, think it, I think we have to be a little bit careful about uh, how we defend this project. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't think we have uh, a tremendous amount to contribute to universities and that in many universities, including my own, we are deeply appreciated. So I, I come from a religious studies department. I'm in a religious studies department that's deeply valued by, uh, by the institution. Um, but I would also say that one of the reasons it's deeply valued is that it's got pretty fuzzy borders, um, that almost everybody in the department has relationships with other parts of the university and think of the work they do um, in, a, in a, not just interdisciplinary, but just there's a lot of fuzzy boundaries and it's not just our department that has fuzzy boundaries. So I think there's gonna be some real challenges um, facing universities about how to organize their work in the face of declining enrollment, and the, in my view, the very probable end of the four-year degree as the basic de degree. So I think we've got a lot of challenges, and I'm, you know, I look forward to working on them. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we do is incredibly important. I just think we're in a time of rapid change for reasons partly having to do with the financing of, of universities. There's some big social challenges right now. Um, Okay, uh, any other final comments before we end? All right, with that challenge to the nature of education more broadly, um, I think it's not accidental that our conversation ended there because your work has always pushed those boundaries in really, really productive ways. So um, this isn't just a Winnie fan club. These are people who have been deeply persuaded by your work and in a, in a um, a really substantive way, and um, I hope that these awards are the kinds of awards that make people really think about their legacy or, or their contribution in new ways, and I hope that we've startled you today in thinking about your contribution in new ways as well. So congratulations again.